Good morning, and welcome to this installment of the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta's monthly webcast series. My name is Sarisha Gunta. I'm Council and Education Director with the Partnership. And today we will be talking about articles and bylaws and corporate governance. We're excited to have with us today Talmadge and Finger, who has spoken on this topic before for our nonprofits. And we're thrilled to have him back with us again to share his insight on this very important topic. Talmadge, thanks so much for being here today. Before Talmadge goes you, into before Talmadge goes into the substance of today's topic, I want to take this opportunity to tell our audience a little bit about PBPA and our mission. PBPA provides free legal assistance to community-based nonprofits. And the way we do this is by connecting nonprofits with services from the leading attorneys at nonprofit, I'm sorry, at corporations and law firms in the Atlanta metro area. Our volunteers assist nonprofits with business law matters. PBPA clients are all 501c3 organizations that operate primarily in the metro Atlanta area or are headquartered here. Our nonprofit clients serve low income and disadvantaged individuals and the nonprofits are otherwise unable to afford legal services. If you are interested in applying to be a client, please visit our website. Also at our website, we have a wealth of resources that are available for free to anyone. And these include articles, podcasts, and past webcasts. Um, today's webcast with Talmadge will also be posted on our website in a few days. And in a few more months, um, we hope to be able to offer in-person workshops. And when we have those available again, they will be posted on the events page on our website. And now um, a quick legal disclaimer. Please keep in mind that the information that Talmadge will be sharing today is just general guidance. It is not specific legal advice. Um, if you have questions related to specifics for your organization, please reach out to an attorney. And today's presentation is copywritten by PBPA. And now Talmadge, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Sarisha, and thanks to uh, everyone who joined today to watch this. Just to introduce myself briefly before diving in, uh, my name is Talma Jenfinger. I am currently an in-house attorney at UPS, where I focus on uh, mergers, acquisitions, and customer transactions, particularly in the technology space. Before joining UPS around two years ago, I was a corporate attorney at a law firm here in Atlanta, King and Spalding, for about nine years. And uh, as Sarisha said, I've, I've done a lot with PBPA since being in, really since starting at my job, and it's a great organization. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come back and talk to you a little bit about corporate governance. Um, also, as Sarisha said, the way we're going to structure this today is the first, call it two thirds of the presentation, I'm gonna walk through some general guidelines on the topic and go through the slides and then there'll be time for Q&A at the end. So feel free as we touch on things to use the Q&A feature to send any questions and, and we'll get to as many of those as we possibly can once this is done. So uh, corporate governance, just to level set, for everyone. When we talk about corporate governance, what are we talking about? You all probably know this, but basically we're talking about the collective body of mechanisms, policies, procedures, rules, and regulations that govern how a company, how a nonprofit in this case operates, what it does, how it does it, how it's formed, how it's dissolved, et cetera. And there are a variety of sources. And if you can, if you view these as a hierarchy, two general ideas, as you move down the ladder we're about to discuss, things get both more specific and detailed and they're controlled by everything above it. So the first and most important source of corporate governance is 
the state nonprofit corporation law. And Georgia, that's the Georgia nonprofit corporate code, um, which governs the formation, operation, and dissolution of nonprofits. Below that, you have the governing documents, which are the documents that are filed with, that are filed or adopted. We'll get to that in a minute by the particular organization itself to govern. And in descending order of importance, those are the Articles of Incorporation, the bylaws, and the policies and procedures. Um, and to talk, the one other thing that I would add for everyone's reference that we're not covering today is that. If you're a 501c3, in addition to these sources, you also have to stay compliant with the U.S. Internal Revenue Code. And I know that PBPA has a lot of educational materials about that. So this is this is not an exhaustive list, um, and that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. Uh, so if we turn to the actual governing documents, again, these are adopted by a particular nonprofit. So they're specific to each organization. And the first and most important of these are the Articles of Incorporation. You file these with the Georgia Secretary of State. That's how your nonprofit corporation is formed. They lay out the purpose of the corporation and they contain some other key governance provisions we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, and these are, this is generally a one to two page, very high level guide to how the corporation operates. Below that, you've got the bylaws, which are what you can think of as the rules of the road, the internal operating manual that are more detailed than the articles and spell out some specific governance functions. These are not filed with the Secretary of State. And then below the bylaws, you've got a series of individual policies and procedures that govern specific topics, such as financials, conflicts of interest, document retention, and any other number. We're not actually going to be talking about policies and procedures today. Uh, that's This, this conversation is gonna be limited to the articles and the bylaws, but they are very important. And I would strongly encourage all of you to look for the other resources that PBPA has around those, to ask questions and to focus on those as well, because they're a very important uh, source of governance. Um, so before we start talking about articles and bylaws though, let's level set on why corporate governance matters. And some of these are probably fairly intuitive, but I think it's important to lay them out and make sure we're all thinking about this in the right way, because it really does matter. If you've got good, robust corporate governance, you're going to have better directors and officers because they, they are going to have clearly defined roles and responsibilities. You can, you can increase the amount of oversight and assessment of their performance. You have objective criteria that you can use to measure against it. And you also, which we'll talk about in a bit, they're also protected and can act in a way that is in their best judgment in good faith in the interest of the nonprofit to help it function. It also, obviously, if you've got better corporate governance, you're less likely to run into noncompliance with applicable laws and regulations. You're going to reduce the risk of scandal or negative publicity that we've all seen and that is every company's worst nightmare. And finally, you're going to decrease the cost of capital and increase the amount that you have available to you because lenders know all the things that we just talked about. And as a result, they're very focused on seeing high quality governance um, because it improves the predictability. It increases the operating results and their ability to return on it. So, and those are just a handful of, of the many benefits of good corporate governance and why we why this matters. The other thing that's going to become clear as we dig into the discussion is, as with many areas of the law, form matters. There's, 
you've got to make sure the right provisions are spelled out in the right documents or otherwise without meaning to you can end up in trouble you can end up in a situation where you're not compliant with the code you've got a board member who's unexpectedly liable for an action that they wouldn't have thought they would be so one of the things we're going to focus on as we dive into the discussion of articles is by and bylaws is what has to be in each why it matters and where it should go. As Sarisha said at the start, this is just a survey. There are a lot of pitfalls. So this is intended to give you a sense of some of the pitfalls so you can avoid them. But if you've got questions, I would go back, look at the documents, and then talk to PVPA or talk to another attorney. Because this is an area, again, where you want to make sure that it's right so that you don't inadvertently end up with a governance issue that would be easily avoided with just putting a clause in the articles, putting a clause in the bylaws. So let's start with the articles themselves. As I said earlier, these are filed with the Georgia Secretary of State. That's how the corporation is formed. Is formed. When you file them, be aware that they are publicly available to anyone for a for a fee. Um, this is a pretty high level document. As I said, it's usually a couple of pages max. And some of the key provisions that they either must or should include are a charitable purpose or mission statement, whether the corporation has members, some basic provisions around the board of directors that'll govern it, and if you have an exculpatory clause, which limits the liability of directors, that has to be in the articles. And we're going to now tick through each of those key areas individually, starting with the mission statement. The first and most basic thing is the mission statement needs to reflect the mission or purpose of your nonprofit. That sounds kind of obvious, but it is really important that it's done right. It needs to be an accurate, complete, and clear and specific description of the mission statement. And as you're drafting it, it needs to be clear, but it also needs to be sufficiently flexible that you can continue to grow and evolve your nonprofit in a manner where you don't have to go back and change the mission statement every couple of years because of natural expansions. You also need to know if there's ever a challenge around whether you're complying with your mission statement, a court's just going to look at the exact words that you have written down. This is not a matter of interpretation. They're not interested in the spirit of the mission statement. They're going to look at the words. And so you need to make sure that the words reflect what you do and allow for the important activities. The other thing I'll note, again, this isn't in the scope of this, but the mission statement is critical to your tax exempt status. The language needs to track and convey your nonprofit's tax exempt status. Generally, it's going to be similar to the language that you use in the uh, Form 990s that you file with the IRS. And the last point I'll make on this is that if the mission changes, the articles need to be amended to reflect the new mission. You've always got to be operating in accordance with that mission statement. That also, just as an aside, if the mission changes, there are also implications that we don't have time to get into on the tax exempt status. And so you, you'd need to be sure to check on what you have to do with the IRS around that. Um, another area that can be addressed in the Articles of Incorporation is whether or not the nonprofit has members. Under Georgia law, any nonprofit can have members, but they're not required to, and many do not. If I had to guess, I'd suspect that the majority of your nonprofits today probably don't, but some of them might. Um, Members are, in a lot of ways, 
with some crucial differences, the nonprofit equivalent of shareholders and a private corporation. So if an organization has members, the most important thing that they do is they will elect and oversee the board of directors. There are typically going to be some reserved matters that may require majority member approval in addition to majority board approval, and they can also dissolve the corporation. If it doesn't have members, then the way a nonprofit is typically set up, the way I'm sure many of yours are, you have a self-governing board and directors that elect themselves. We call this self-perpetuating. Um, and the articles, if there are members, will spell out quorum and similar requirements for meetings of the members, how they elect directors, et cetera. This is another area where the articles need to reflect the reality of the situation. So if your articles, which you see with, with older nonprofits, if your articles provide for members, there aren't any anymore, or you don't want them, you need to amend them to make sure that's correct. Um, briefly, to talk about some of the rights and responsibilities of members that you see, the most important difference between a nonprofit and shareholders of a private corporation is you don't distribute any funds to the members. They, they're not owners in that sense. The reason it's a tax exempt organization, assuming it is, is that you are not making a profit, you're not distributing profits. Um, under the Georgia law, there aren't very many legally required rights, but you can always, you've got a lot of flexibility if you want to grant certain rights to the members so that certain controls are held with them rather than with, say, the board. Um, you can also have obligations. All of that should be spelled out in the articles and bylaws. Some of the really common ones, just to tick through very quickly, are elect directors, vote on a merger or sale of the company, vote on dissolution, and those would be any other rights that you may spell out in the articles or bylaws. There would also be provisions for recurring annual meetings, provisions for setting up special meetings, the right to audit and access information about the nonprofit, maybe around the financial condition, maybe around compliance. Um, and members, if you have them, are, very often do have some kind of annual assessment or dues to support the, to support the nonprofit or maybe an initial contribution. Um, so that's members in a nutshell. If it's applicable to anyone, happy to answer some more some more specific questions, but generally there's a lot of flexibility there. The next topic, and this is probably the most important non-required thing in the Articles of Corporation is exculpation of directors. And before talking about exculpation, we need to really briefly touch on a topic that is somewhat outside of the scope of this presentation, which is the fiduciary duties of directors and officers. There are three basic duties that by law, directors and officers have to a nonprofit, or to a nonprofit just in many ways, just like they do to private companies. These are the duties of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience. There's a lot here with all of this, but at a very high level, the duty of care requires directors to exercise ordinary and reasonable care and the performance of their duties. This is a very broad requirement at its most simplest. You can boil it down to directors have to be informed they have to exercise their independent best judgment. They have to act in a reasonable manner. And um, they can rely on committees, experts, and others, as long as that's warranted. The duty of loyalty, 
you have to, each director has to act in the best interest of the corporation, not in his or her own best interests. This is focused on things like conflicts of interest and, and self inurement, taking advantage of corporate opportunities. It's really something of a smell test. If it smells wrong, you probably shouldn't be doing it. And then finally, you've got the duty of obedience. This is the last piece that, uh, this piece is unique to nonprofits. Uh, private corporations do not have to do this, but it requires directors to act in a manner consistent with the governing documents, the articles and bylaws of a corporation. This is another reason that a common theme that you're gonna hear throughout this is you need to be doing what your articles say, what your bylaws say. If they say something different, you need to amend them because this is a legal duty and directors can be personally liable for taking actions that are inconsistent. So with that very brief overview, let's look at exculpation. A nonprofit can limit the liability of its directors for monetary damages for acts and capacities, at, for acts and omissions in their capacities as directors if they include an exculpation clause in their articles. This can't be in the bylaws, this can't be a policy or procedure or a board resolution, it has to be in the publicly filed articles. This will limit your li a director's liability for breaches of that first duty that I talked about, the duty of care. You cannot limit by law a director's liability for effectively breaches of the duty of loyalty. So any appropriation of a business opportunity of the corporation, unlawful distributions to, to members, as we talked about, they don't get those. Uh, any actions involving intentional misconduct or knowing violations of law, those cannot be limited. And a director can be, or each director remains personally liable uh, either to the corporation, to the community, to the attorney general, uh, bringing an action on behalf of the public, for any of those violations, but it does eliminate your liability to the corporation for good faith actions that maybe didn't turn out the right way. You're not going to get questioned about was this a reasonable action that you took? Were you informed? Were you appropriately responsible? The last thing that I would note is you cannot retroactively limit the liability of directors. And this is a provision that because it's not required by law, a lot of the forms that you would get for articles on legal Zoom or, or otherwise don't include this language. So this is one where I would say, check your articles. If you don't have an exculpation clause, reach out to PBPA, reach out to your attorneys and add that because this really matters to your board so that they are not personally responsible for any of this. Um, just to very briefly touch on a couple of other key restrictions that are in, that should be included in the articles. It's, it's a best practice to include a prohibition against private inurement, which is effectively taking opportunities of the corporation for your own benefit. You should also include restrictions on political activity. This, this is important in particular for the tax, for maintaining the tax exempt status of your nonprofit. There's a lot there, but at a high level, a lot of political activities will result in you forfeiting your non your tax exempt status uh, which obviously is not going to be good for getting donations and and support so better to include appropriate limitations on that in your articles as a precaution um, to begin with 
And that's really it on the articles, as, as I talked about. They're a very high-level document. They're intended to be the broad strokes outline of governance. The bylaws get a little bit more specific. These are, again, these are the rules of the road. This is the owner's manual telling how the corporation is actually run. Also at a high level, but much more detailed than the articles. If the articles are generally one to two pages, bylaws you'll see from anywhere from five to 15 or 20 pages on average. They're not filed publicly, although they are filed with the tax authorities and a lot of them are available for tax exempt companies online. Um, they're not required. You can have a corporation, you can have a nonprofit, unlike the articles, you can have a nonprofit that is legally set up and functional without bylaws, but they're critical to help a nonprofit function effectively because they allow you to adopt procedures and policies that are tailored to your needs. They can help you resolve internal disputes. They go into a little more detail about the actual day-to-day -day governance, and they're expected by donors and foundations, and I would add lenders, as we talked about earlier. Um, so to talk about some of the key provisions that you should expect to see in the bylaws and that you should look for. And uh, we can go on to the next slide now. Perfect, thanks. Uh, under state law, you've got a lot of flexibility. The articles, as we talked about, are a pretty set form with a handful of mandatory procedures or a handful of mandatory provisions, and then a few more unique, more individually tailored optional provisions. The bylaws, you have total flexibility. So you should tailor them to reflect your missions and goals and activities. And again, how you actually operate. I'll say it one more time. If it's in your bylaws, you should be doing it. If you're not doing it, you should amend your bylaws. This is another place where you're gonna have a mission statement. Everything we talked about before about clear, accurate, and complete continues to apply. You also should have, it should also be consistent with the mission statement and the articles of incorporation. Frankly, I think you should copy and paste the wording exactly to avoid any inconsistency. And I'll note, if there is an inconsistency between any, of prov any provision of the bylaws, including the mission statement and the articles or the Georgia nonprofit code, then the articles control or the nonprofit corporation con code controls, as it may be. If you have members, you'll have some more detailed provisions in the bylaws around those. So, Roles and responsibilities, if they have terms, term length, um, procedures for the resignation and removal of members. Uh, again, similar concepts to the articles, but a level down of granularity. So much, you also will include provisions on the board of directors. Here's where you get into a lot more detail around the composition and the size of a board. This can be a set number. More often, you would see it as a range. So for example, no fewer than three directors and no more than seven. You'll include term lengths, limits, what happens in the case of vacancies, how, they're, how directors are elected. That's another one that, as we talked about before, needs to will vary if you've got members and the members elect them versus if you've got a self-perpetuating board and the board elects the replacements. Any kind of restrictions on the number of consecutive terms someone can have, provisions for meetings of the board. That's both the regular meetings that are gonna happen maybe quarterly uh, maybe more often, depending on your corporation. Also provisions in the case there's a decision that needs to be made for special meetings, um, what kind of notice you need, what constitutes a quorum, 
what requires a simple majority versus a super majority or a unanimous decision, whether decisions can be made by what we call a written consent, which is effectively the board members don't hold the meeting, don't hold a meeting, but you circulate a set of resolutions and those are usually unanimously uh, adopted in writing without a meeting. You also include provisions for establishing committees, uh, whether they're standing committees like a finance committee, um, as an easy example, or whether they're more ad hoc special purpose committees. Again, I'll note this is an area where it's important to maintain flexibility. This is an area where you want to include, there are a couple of key committees that you may want to provide for, um, but then you also want to give the board the flexibility as needed to establish other committees, including other standing committees or ad hoc committees to deal with a particular issue or a particular project that's of importance. You also need to include the procedures for the resignation and removal of your directors. And you have to include a no compensation clause because under Georgia law, directors cannot be compensated for their service as a director of a nonprofit. Now, note that is different from reimbursement of expenses. So uh, you can provide for them to be reimbursed for reasonable expenses incurred by them in serving as a director, but you can't include compensation. The next area that the bylaws should address is officers. You need to include their roles, their titles, a description of their responsibilities. Every corporation under Georgia law has to have a secretary and has to have a president or CEO or executive director or other equivalent officer. But you also can have other officers and, and most nonprofits do. And this is another area where it should be customized to fit the needs and activities of the nonprofit. If you have a lot of employees, you may need a chief HR officer. You may not. I do think you probably would want, unless you're very, very small, some kind of a, a CFO or head. If you've got an in-house general counsel or chief legal officer, you can provide for that here. Again, it's going to vary depending on your size, depending on your activities, but, and you've got the flexibility, but whatever it is, it has to be set out in the bylaws. Finally, the bylaws are where you can include a provision for indemnifying directors and officers. So this is similar to, but different from an exculpation clause. An exculpation clause, as we talked about before, is in the article, it has to be in there, and it says, that a director will not be liable to the corporation for activities in the scope as a director, again, with exception of breaches of duties of loyalty, criminal activities, et cetera. Indemnification clauses provide that the corporation will indemnify or make a director or officer whole for any losses that they suffer because of their activities. And, in the role. And this is a, you have a lot of flexibility with this. Generally under the law, a corporation can indemnify an officer or director for any activity as long as that director or officer acted in good faith, reasonably believed the conduct was in the best interest of the corporation if they were acting in their official capacity or not opposed to the best interests of the corporation if they were acting at a private capacity and they had no reasonable cause to believe it was unlawful. These can also be set up as a mandatory or permissive. So they can either say the corporation will indemnify each director and officer, in which case it's not optional, or they say the corporation may indemnify, in which case it would be up to, say, the, the members or the board of directors if applicable. 
generally directors and officers, as you would expect, prefer it to be a mandatory. They don't have to justify it, but you can do it either way. The last thing that I would note on the D on the director and officer indemnification is you need to be cognizant if you have DNO insurance, which I would encourage all of you to have, you need to be cognizant of the interaction between this indemnification provision and the DNO policy. If you want to make sure that you aren't that the corporation isn't going to have to come out of pocket for amounts that aren't covered by the DNO policy, you need to expressly limit it to the same categories of actions that are covered by that. If you want to cast it more broadly, so if there are any holes in the policy, uh, you know that the corporation is there as a backstop, you can do it that way. There's no right or wrong answer to how you do it, but it needs to be intentional and you need to be cognizant of uh, what, what you're doing. So now that we've talked about some of the provisions, I want to briefly touch on some of the common pitfalls. First off, you don't want the bylaws to be too specific. They're more specific than the articles, but you've got to have flexibility. It's a pain to amend the bylaws. It is not something you want to do every time anyone does some new action. They're intended to be a governance framework. They are not intended to dictate the day-to-day -day operations. You don't want to include um, information that's going to change frequently, that's going to need, or that's going to need constant updating. Your policies and procedures, which again are, are governance do, governing documents that are a step below the bylaws, that's where you get more specific. That's where you govern the day-to-day. Here, you want to include the overall framework within which the corporation will operate without creating a bunch of impediments. And as we talked about, it needs to conform to your actual practices. You've got a duty of obedience, and if you're not conforming to what's in the bylaws, directors and officers can be liable. Uh, if they don't comply, change your practices or amend the bylaws. There's no wrong answer, whichever makes more sense. One thing I'd note, and this is a common pitfall, is that you need to, this also applies to things like overly strict deadlines. So if you've got a requirement in your bylaws that anytime there's a special meeting of the board, you have to be given 30 days prior written notice, and you've, or say certain reports have to be provided to directors or have to be provided to members within a certain period of time. You've got to comply with that. And if these are too onerous and they're restricting your freedom too much, that's an area that you should, that's an area that you should amend. Um, a related issue is when you introduce a lot of unnecessary procedures. So, if you've got overly complex due process procedures, say for the removal of a member or the removal of a director, where if you think a director is acting inappropriately, they've got a right to they've got a right to hear and respond to what it is, and you build in a whole lot of processes that are intended to be protective you can end up with a situation where instead of actually functioning to provide appropriate protection and good governance, you just have a lot of red tape and a lot of policies that you have to go through and you end up unable to act because all of your director's attention, all of your officer's attention is focused on meeting with these complex requirements. So you need to be focused on the balance between achieving the goal and also putting in a lot of unnecessary process. You also need to be sure that the bylaws are consistent both upwards with the articles and downwards with the policies and procedures. And just as a reminder, as we talked about before in the hierarchy, anything at all that any corporate do governance documents that are inconsistent with the Georgia corporate law, the corporate law controls, 
any other inconsistencies, the articles control over the bylaws and everything below it. The bylaws control over policies and procedures. But at the end of the day, even though that's the way if it gets challenged, a court's going to look at it and they're going to determine which you actually have to follow. You create a lot of confusion and you end up in a bad situation if you have inconsistent items in your articles versus your bylaws versus your policies. So you should look at all of them together and make sure that they they sync up. Um, so with that said, before we turn to questions, just a very few key takeaways that we focused on. Number one, governance matters. I know it's a lot, but you should really focus on it. Um, because it will make your life easier. It will make you better at functioning as a nonprofit and performing the mission that you were established to. And it'll help you avoid trouble and get loans. As part of that, remember that the form matters as much as the substance. And there are several of these items that have to be in a certain place, have to be phrased a certain way or else a court's not gonna look at it and say, well, we all know what you meant. So you need to be focused on it. And one tool that I will briefly shout out that PBPA offers is they've got a number of nonprofit legal checkups throughout the year where you have a bunch of attorneys sit down, ask questions about your bylaws, about your articles, and then you can get projects where there are holes identified, I would strongly recommend as a participant, if you've got questions, take advantage of that because it's a really good, it's a really good chance to make sure that you are complying with these because there's a lot there. And uh, with that, I am happy to answer any questions and thank you everyone for, for listening. How much we do have um, quite a few questions. Um, one that I'll start off with is, does a nonprofit have to file articles of incorporation for every state that they're actively working in? No, they do not. That's a really good question. So you file the articles of incorporation in what we'll call your, your home state. That doesn't necessarily have to be the state in which you're incorporated, in which you're headquartered, although it usually is. But that's the first state. That's the state whose laws will govern you. Beyond that, if you're doing enough business in any particular state, you would have to do an annual registration to conduct business uh, as a foreign corporation in that state. Um, the requirements for figuring out what's enough business and do you have to file one of those registrations, especially in today's internet world are, are pretty complex and we probably don't have time to do it. Sarisha, you guys may have literature about it. And, and I know that's something that we focus on in the legal checkups as well, but it's a good question. And generally, no, just articles in one state. And if necessary, you file to operate as a foreign corporation and in any others. And our next question you partially addressed, um, they ask, should articles of incorporation ever be updated? You mentioned that, you know, if your mission, if an organization's mission changes, um, they should be updated. If they do not have an exculpation clause, they should be updated to include an exculpation clause. Um, are there other situations where they should be changed or updated? There are, and I would say wherever, assuming, let's put to the side situations where the articles, uh, there was an error or something that needs to be fixed. I would say when the needs of a corporation change in a way that the articles no longer work, they should be updated. One easy example that I can give is if the articles include provisions that you know, there will always be a board of directors of a particular size or a range. And the organization's grown a lot, 
you want to get some more areas of expertise and because they're of the way they're drafted you don't have enough flexibility to have the board the size you want that may be an opportunity to amend the articles depending on the way they're drafted that may also be more of a bylaw situation uh again that goes to the how specific is it but there are definitely situations and with that i'd say one important thing is make sure your directors and your officers are familiar with your articles, are familiar with your bylaws, have it in your board on, have it in your onboarding packets, have them look at them regularly and ask, I think every couple of years, it's a good exercise to think about where your organization is and look through all of these governing documents, the articles, the bylaws, the policies and procedures and ask, does this track what we're doing? Does this make sense? Does this provide the framework within which we can most effectively achieve our mission? And we've had a couple of folks ask for um, verbiage related to the exculpation clause. Um, and I will say that we uh, generally do, don't provide verbiage over a webcast. Um, if you're a client of PBPAs, though, um, as Talmadge mentioned, um, if you're coming to a legal checkup, that's definitely something that we would be able to follow up on and help you with revising your bylaws, um, even if you're not coming to legal checkup. Um, if that's a question you have in your client of PBPAs, reach out to your staff attorney. Um, but Talmadge, did you have anything more specific you want to say about exculpation language? that you haven't already said? No, I think that the best we can do on, on this is uh, make the audience aware that it's out there and say, go look for it. And if you aren't sure, ask a lawyer because it really matters. And, and this is one of those areas where there's a lot of law, as you know, <laughs> Sarisha and it's impossible. We could do a couple hour webinar on fiduciary duties and exculpation alone. So I would say look for it and see if it's there. And if you don't see it or you aren't sure, ask a lawyer. If you're a PBPA client, ask PBPA. And I guess I'd also say this is an easy thing to fix. I am, uh, I'm currently working on a project for a client of yours that involves this. I worked on one last year that involved the same thing. It's a very easy fix and it makes a big difference, so. Definitely. Um, we have a question related to bylaws, which is um, interesting. Uh, they're asking what changes to bylaws have you seen or recommend with the pandemic um, when you're doing most of your board meetings and operations virtually? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I'd say the most common ones that I've seen are cleanups, for lack of a better word, where there were, you know, for example, a nonprofit thought it was really important to have in-person meetings. They don't want, they didn't want to do a lot by consent. They had monthly meetings with strict quorum requirements. That's, that's just one example. And then with the pandemic, that no longer worked. That no longer made sense. And they wanted to ensure there was flexibility for virtual meetings. They wanted to provide maybe for less frequent meetings, but in exchange, they wanted to require regular updates on particular projects maybe more got punted to committees. It really, it can vary a lot based on how an individual corporation was set up. But generally with the pandemic, the biggest focus that I saw was everyone wanted to make sure that they had the maximum flexibility to continue to function and have good oversight while not having to all get together in person or not having to have as many meetings and it really it varied but there were a lot of changes around that
And this next question has to do with, I guess, what can be done outside of the bylaws. Um, for example, here, if uh, board members make an exception to a term limit um, that is outlined in the bylaws, uh, how should that be addressed? Do they need to amend the bylaws or can they just do that like independently in a meeting, noting it in the minutes? It's a good question. And I'd say it, it depends on what the bylaws say. If the bylaws just have a flat term limit, no exceptions, no flexibility, and you want to change it, then that's, that would require an amendment to the bylaws because making an exception is inconsistent. If the bylaws are drafted in a way that they say, you know, unless otherwise voted on by a majority of the board or something similar, then you've got the flexibility. Um, so I can't answer that for every situation. I can say it's a good question and it's exactly the right way to think about it. And that's why I said, you need to look at these regularly. And when those come up, look at the bylaws and see what they say and see if, okay, as drafted, do these give us enough flexibility to make this exception or do they not? And what happens when a nonprofit does not operate according to its bylaws? This is a, uh, this is one of those scenarios where you can have a whole range of consequences from on one end, the, it's not good, you should fix it. The chances of anything actually happening to you are, are pretty low unless there's a fight, in which case you're in trouble. All the way, frankly, to you get sued because you violated the duty of obedience and you're personally, you know, and directors and officers find themselves personally liable either to the corporation or to, you know, the attorney general acting in the interests of the public bringing a suit or other stakeholders in the community. It's going to depend on what the, as with anything, the severity depends on what the violation is. Does it cause problems that then get brought to the attention of others, et cetera? But it is, even in the best case scenario, it's one of those situations where we lawyers like to say, Okay, this may be a 1% chance of anything ever going wrong, but if it does go wrong, you're exposed and you're in trouble. So I would say go back and, and make the change. There are also, I think, for certain types of violations, you can also risk your tax exempt status. And uh, that is not my area, and I'm not going to pretend to be able to explain what those are, but that's another risk. And um, the next question I have here, um, trying to go in order here. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the committees and roles um, within a board? Should that be outlined in the bylaws or should that be outlined in policies and procedures? I think that generally speaking, And again, this is one that this is an area where you need to tailor it. I think generally speaking, the best practices are to have in the bylaws provisions for maybe a few very, very critical committees that you know you're going to need and you don't see it changing. Uh, certainly, you don't see that need changing anytime soon. Um, so you're not worried about having to do it. And then, and again, an easy example of that is some kind of finance committee that can oversee what you're doing with the money you receive. Some kind of, um, some kind of committee to deal with uh, conflicts of interest, 
or other similar things. I think there are a handful of pretty critical committees that you want. And beyond that, I think you should have the flexibility. You should give the board the ability to delegate a authority to committees as and when it sees fits, whether whether by establishing new permanent committees as the organization grows or changes, or again, by establishing um, temporary committees. An easy example that I've seen recently is a nonprofit was the, that I worked with a couple of years ago was involved in entering into a major new lease for its headquarters. There was a lot to it. The board wanted some day-to-day -day supervised. They wanted some oversight. And so they established an ad hoc committee to deal with the headquarters lease situation. That's a, that's a pretty specific example of the kind of thing that may come up where the board thinks it's useful. We can't all be in all of this. That's not a good use of our time, but let's have a group of people who are responsible for this and reporting back to the board. So I think that preserving the flexibility while ensuring you've got the essential pieces uh, which will vary by nonprofit, by its size, by its mission, is the best approach. And we have one last question. Um, when submitting the Articles of Incorporation, should the bylaws also be submitted at that time, or can you work on that later? Um, well, the bylaws aren't filed. So you only file the Articles of Incorporation with the state. And that's the step that makes you an actual legally constituted nonprofit. So I would say you definitely, you don't have to file the bylaws. They don't have to be done at the same time. It is generally best to adopt the bylaws either around the same time or you know as quickly as possible after you form the corporation i mean forming a corporation in georgia for example once you do the articles it's it's a matter of hours before that filing is entered it's not a long process and as soon as it's formed you can go ahead and appoint the board and adopt the bylaws. And I think that you will very often see in that kind of initial organizational, uh, whether it's a board meeting or an action by a member who incorporated it, you will often see the bylaws adopted, but you don't have to. Again, they're not required by state law. So you can legally function without bylaws at all. And if it takes a little while to adopt those, you can do that, but uh, I suggest you adopt them as quickly as possible once they're right. <laughs> Take the time to get them right, but uh, yeah. And um, I just saw one other question pop up. Um, I'm not sure I understand this, but um, maybe you do, Selmich. What is the difference between bylaws and standing rules? Um, this is for an organization that has members and subordinate groups. I have to be honest, I'm not, I'm not totally sure what is meant by standing rules in that context. That sounds instinctively to me more like a, a a policy or procedure that a board's adopted, but unlike bylaws, which is kind of a everyone, it's it's a term of art. Everyone knows what it means. I'm not sure what what they mean by standing committee or standing. Yeah, so I think that would be one, um, Jennifer. That would be on a case by case basis, um, depending on what those standing rules are. Um, well, Talmadge, we are now at 10.59, um, and thank you so much for answering all of these questions and sharing your insight and expertise with us today. Um, I hope to our audience members who found this information to be helpful. Thank you guys for joining us today. And Talmadge, always, we appreciate everything you do for PBPA and our nonprofit clients. Thanks. Thanks very much.